going to uh, talk to you about some of our mystery cases, and we have a new mystery case for you. And so we actually have a couple cases for you. And so uh, go back to this way. And then, uh, I'm not very selective in being able to move this pointer. That's what I can do here. Hang on. And so the first case is a gentleman who's 64 years old who uh, basically was transferred to Memorial Hospital for labile hypertension. And the patient uh, had been hospitalized several times, South Florida Baptist, uh, St. Joe Hospital, Tampa General Hospital, had all these hospitalizations for hypertension, uh, which was uncontrolled, uh, as well as uh, for other symptoms uh, that seemed to be accompanying that, which were nausea and vomiting. And so he did have a cerebellar hemorrhage uh, at South Florida Baptist and was transferred to Tampa General Hospital. And he was treated and discharged home on low pressure and cardizen. Supposed to start aspirin after that. Blood pressure got out of control again, and he presented to South Florida Baptist and uh, had some severe head headaches and more blood pressure problems, 208 over 108. He was admitted to the ICU. Uh, his blood pressure uh, was still elevated. He was transferred this time to Memorial Hospital. He had been at St. Joseph's Hospital. We made the rounds in Tampa. And uh, but finally, he came to uh, the Mayo Clinic of Tampa, Memorial Hospital, uh, where we could make some decisions on how to take care of him. So his blood pressure uh, was the number one problem. And so let's see how we handled his blood pressure and what our approach was. And so Going back again to the history, whoops, he has uh, neurofibromatosis, which is, is an unusual disease for us to be seeing, uh, and hypertension dating back to 1996. He had a neurovascular accident in 1996 with some upper extremity weakness. He also had Bell's palsy in 2002, unrelated to uh, the central problems that we were experiencing with uh, strokes. Bilateral cataracts, uh, surgical removal of the cataracts, ventral hernia, uh, some heart disease in the family, brother with bypass surgery. He was a non-smoker. Uh, he's still working despite his blood pressure problems. And as we said, he's on a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker. Has no adverse drug reactions. And so his CT to head without contrast showed a new focal area of increased attenuation in the cerebellar area that was consistent with a new stroke. And then an old focal area of low attenuation consistent with a right lacunar infarct and bilateral vascular calcifications. Um, his MRI showed again the resolving hemorrhage, an old infarct in the right caudate nucleus associated with scar tissue, a moderate amount of periventricular subcortical and right pontine T2 hyperintensities, which were nonspecific. Microvascular ischemic changes was the probable cause. A small aneurysm in the right internal carotid artery. And he had diminutive left retrieval artery arising from the aortic arch. This is not uncommon the dominant right vertebral artery. These are anatomical variations that occur frequently. He had uh, not significant carotid artery stenosis, just uh, non-obstructing, not hemodynamically significant, but some calcified plaque. He had some narrowing up high in the cervical segments and intracranial segments, probably due to chronic dissection, they said, uh, occurring to the radiologist. There was some mild ectasia of the A1 segment of the left internal carotid, and uh, no evidence of aneurysm or AVM. And his physical examination showed his blood pressure is 180 or 50. That's the first time when I saw him. He did have the changes of Bell's palsy. He did have the changes of skin lesions and neurofibromatosis, which were very marked. And he had uh, good pulses, no edema, peripherally. 
So our plan at that time was to continue him on what he was taking, the IV of the beta law, and uh, to uh, look for an MRA of the renal arteries to find uh, a reason uh, for his uh, hypertension, to look for other reasons, uh, more esoteric, such as metanephrine, VMA. Uh, also, the MRA of the renal arteries should be able to give us good views of the kidneys and good views of the adrenal gland. Also, because of his repetitive stroke, uh, to get a neurology consult. And I'll show you his EKG. And his EKG uh, shows some very dramatic changes. He's got um, some flip T waves with upward coving in V1 and V2. He's got little bitty P waves, but there is a, some negative component in V1, making you wonder about his left atrium being enlarged. He's got some STNP wave changes in V3 and V4. So V1 through V4 is STNP wave changes. His uh, axis is uh, about 80, and uh, he does have some uh, prominent voltage. PR interval was normal. Cardiogram uh, showed changes as well. And I'm sorry we don't have this for being able to show. Uh, this is about a time when we were putting echoes on tape, and we don't have that tape. But uh, he did have a normal left ventricular contractility, but he has significant hypertrophy with a posture wall of 15, a septum of 18 to 20, with an asymmetrical septal hypertrophy with a ratio of the septum of greater than 1.3 to the posture wall, which uh, also some systolic anterior motion, the entry loop of the mitral valve, and a resting gradient, all of these meeting criteria for subaortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with two plus aortic regurgitation, so some aortic valvular disease with calcification as well. And uh, all these changes, which may be primary or secondary, we have to invent uh, two diseases, as we want to call it primary, and say that he has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the same time that he has uh, severe hypertension. Or we can say, oh, this is secondary to hypertension, which is also occurs and, and uh, is not uncommon. And so especially with the hypertension where he's got systolic pressures frequently in the 200 range. So um, I don't think we need to invent uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to be able to see these changes. And so we're looking at his blood pressure log and uh, trying to decide uh, uh, my, my system goes back and forth here. Uh, but his blood pressure here is very interesting. He's on a libido log drip. And uh, here's the accounting of his blood pressure uh, in the morning at 7 a.m. and going down to about Oh, it looks like uh, 4 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 2.23 over 1.22, 2.40 over 1.32, 2.24 over 1.33, and then 1.72, then it's going back down again. So we have that peak. Let's look over here and see what it looks like. And here we go again. Uh, we can start uh, starting in here at 13.56, and we're back at uh, 2.20 or 121 at 14.30, and then we can see during the night we might made another peak at 21.20, uh, 2.33 over 125, and so, and then uh, they called me, of course, and uh, we gave him some procardia PO, and we gave him some clonidine PO to bring that blood pressure down, because here he is on a levetalol drip in the ICU. Wow. Yeah. Uncontrolled blood pressure that uh, corresponds to, and here's another blood pressure here. Yeah, you know, we've got it twice. It, it's got some kind of pattern to it, and it's not due to the drug that we're giving him uh, that we have this pattern. But we can see here's the way of all drip, and here's the 0.25 milligrams. It increases to 0.75, decreases to 0.25. So we are making some changes to correspond with this, not keeping it steady. When his blood pressure goes down, then we're dropping the drip, and when it goes up, we're increasing the drip. And then when it 
it gets really uh, way up, then we're giving it some extra oil drug. And so let's take a look at this pattern again, and we'll see the same pattern. But let's look over here. This is uh, when we transferred him to the floor from the intensive care unit, and we're seeing a pattern that's occurring that's very similar, but we don't have all of the markers because before we were getting markers all the time in the ICU. But here it's every four hours, and so you can see a sudden, sudden jump, which really wasn't a jump because we could tell from the ICU that it was a gradual rise and stayed there and then went back down again. But now when you're looking over four hours, it just looks like an impossible jump and then back down again, jump back down again. But it looks like it's occurring pretty much the same time every day. It's got this rhythm to it. So let's look at some more logs. Whoops, let's go back. There we go, there we go. And so we got more logs here. As we get more logs, I can't control this very well, but you can see that we've got the peak still occurring. And now it looks like it's gotten better with the medication that we have. And we started with some new medications. We started with alpha blocker. And we start on a beta blocker more aggressively. And so he is on an alpha blocker. Uh, and you can see the difference from the alpha blocker. We're seeing a dramatic change. And then uh, that's the end of this record here. So let's go and see why we're doing what we're doing. And look, we've got 97 over 55. So uh, we got control of it, didn't we? So let's go back over to the next. And Hassan, I may mean, need you to move this for me. If you could uh, give us the next slide. There we go. And uh, there we go. Back, back, back. There we go. So I'll let you, if you could move the slides for us, Hassan, I've got in and out contact here that I can't move them. So uh, we did get the results of some of our testing coming back, and uh, the renal arteries. Uh, I can see the left one. We'll find out more about that. The left one looked pretty good. Uh, and the chromogram in A, chromogram in A, I don't know if you're familiar with this test. Do you know this test, Bob? No, I've not used it. Yeah, this is the one that I use as my screening test for pheochromocytoma. And so instead of getting the urine collections, which uh, are very cumbersome, people have to be on a special VMA diet for a couple days. You can't have any vanilla. You can't have bananas. Uh -huh. I don't think you can have caffeine. It's a bunch of stuff you can't have. Instead of going through all that rigmarole, which uh, you know, basically dietary restriction and then 24-hour urine collection, you know, I just usually do the chromogranin A as my screening test. And it takes a while for that to come back, but you can see the chromogranin A was off the chart about 15 times normal. And yeah. so uh, that's what I use for screening for feel rather than going through all this urine stuff. But you can see the urine stuff shows that norepinephrine that was uh, way up. Metanephrine is up not as much. Norepi is uh, not too bad. And epinephrine is elevated. And uh, it was probably supine. The dopamine level was way up. Total catecholamines were up very high. Next slide, please. And so here's some more lab work that we got. 12, the volume, urine volume was only 1250 in 24 hours. Uh, and here's some norepinephrine uh, that's higher than it was before. This is 634. So that's six times the upper limit of normal. Here's some epinephrine. There is some dibutamine that's in range. But the total count of means is elevated. More metanephrine down at the bottom. Norepinephrine and metanephrine, both of which are dramatically elevated. So total metanephrine, 11,384 for 24 hours. That's a lot of metanephrine. Mm -hmm. Pressure's out of whack. And then here's the VMA, which measures vanilla as well as banana stuff. And the VMA is 48.4. I don't know if he had any bananas to eat that day, but uh, hopefully he didn't. Uh, or maybe vanilla. Uh, but you can see it's 48.4. And that's very dietary dependent. And so these numbers are astronomical, astronomical. Uh, and beyond a doubt, you know, he certainly has 
biochemistry of a pheochromocytoma. We don't know the location yet from our study here, but we've got the biochemistry. And then we also were checking out the renal arteries, which gave us an opportunity to look at the adrenal glands as well. And the right renal artery is normal. Left couldn't be seen uh, very well. Sometimes you get veins overlying the arteries, and uh, you can't see as well if you're in a venous vein. And so uh, it looked OK. Next slide. And so we, this is a mass. This is a, we always measure masses by some uh, fruit size. And uh, this is going between orange and grapefruit, maybe a navel orange. This is big as a kidney. It's bigger than a kidney. Yeah. And so this is one huge pheochromocytoma that has chemically been diagnosed as being responsible for this gentleman's hypertension. And uh, from this is the first time it's been diagnosed in this gentleman from his trips to South Florida Baptist, Tampa General, and St. Joe. And uh, interesting enough, he's got the signature on him because if you can read his skin, he's not tattooed. It doesn't say pheochromocytoma on a tattoo, but it certainly when you see neurofibromatosis, that's a real tip-off because at least 5% of neurofibromatosis patients of one type will develop pheochromocytoma. So just take one look at him and you say pheochromocytoma. So there's no great mystery about this case, but it turned out to be a mystery case because he cycled through three hospitals without being diagnosed. Wow. Next. And so this was a CT of the abdomen that was read as a hyperdense solid mass, seven centimeters in size, left adrenal gland, it was right against the pancreatic tail, the kidneys didn't appear to arise from them, the right adrenal gland was okay, there was also a smaller, more hypodense lesion on the left retroperitoneal area, and uh, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, because this uh, certainly looked like it was well contained in a capsule. And so um, now we're faced with what we've defined as anatomically a pheochromocytoma and biochemically a pheochromocytoma. And we have a patient who has uncontrolled hypertension. So all those come together as being an indication for surgery, which uh, would be uh, a removal of the tumor. Of, uh, this was before endoscopic approaches and before robotic approaches. So it would be a regular surgical technique. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's something that certainly is a hazardous uh, procedure uh, because you this tumor in your hands as a surgeon and you're squeezing it and you're tugging on it and it's all full of metanephrine and epinephrine and that's a subject to being connected to the bloodstream. And uh, you can expect to be taking a roller coaster ride in terms of blood pressure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was going to ask Bob Carroll, have you had experience uh, doing a FIO in the OR as an anesthesiologist? Uh, the, the fact is, uh, no. But this is, uh, you really, really, really want to block alpha and beta. And so that's a good point. And you can see we did that. And the last three days that I showed on his blood pressure log were in preparation for surgery. And his blood pressure suddenly became controlled for the first time because we were getting prepared for surgery. Is this the kind of surgery you would expect to be done in a community hospital? I'd be nervous about that. Yeah, well, we, we, we felt that uh, since we made the diagnosis, not St. Joe, Tampa General, and South Florida Baptist, we, we had the wherewithal to take it out. And we needed the honor and privilege. And so we decided that what we needed was a combination of things to be able to do that. So let's see the next slide. So there's a question if we should do an MIBG scan. And this is a radioactive iodine-labeled scan. And this is an example, not showing our patient, but showing how it lights up a pheo. And that's used frequently to find out if there's ectopic pheo that's outside the adrenal gland. And uh, the problem with doing this test, it was suggested by the consultant uh, from endocrinology that we do this test to make sure there's no pheo anywhere else. 
And uh, I was very reluctant to do that, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the iodine, uh, even if you treat pre-treat the patient with potassium iodine, failure of the thyroid gland later after the exposure to this hot iodine is mm. a significant problem. And so, if you do, this is a test that that knocks out the thyroid, and so you can pretty much count on being on thyroid pills the rest of your life after this. Well, that's not a problem for the endocrinologist. He readily accepts that. But it was certainly a problem for me and my patient. And we said, hey, that's not a good thing. Why do we want to be have a new disease, which would be hypothyroidism, just because we did the scan? So we decided we'd just do a PET scan, and, which we did, and, uh, and see if we see any ectopic tumor anywhere. Not doing a tumor-specific theochromo marker, but doing a, a more of a general hypermetabolic gland test, which I believe we did, and which did not show any ectopic pheochromoxytoma. And so we felt reassured of that. So we didn't submit him to the MIVG scan and uh, hypothyroidism for the rest of his life. Just didn't feel like that's justified. And every time I come up against this, uh, I do the same thing. I, I haven't elected to do this yet. Uh, but I did see a patient recently who ruled out for FIO, and her endocrinologist did elect to do it, and lo and behold, she's on thyroid maintenance pills daily. And so I just don't, can't really justify that at this point. Mm -hmm. So next question. So this is uh, what you saw, is that we started alpha blocking agents 10 days before surgery, we had uh, lots of beta blockers flowing into the patient during the whole stay, as you saw, with low pressure and the beta law, beta law intravenous strip for a while when the patient was in the ICU. But for the first time, we did have control of his blood pressure, and the control meant that he didn't get those spikes at 4 o'clock. So we were real happy with that. Whatever that circadian rhythm was of the BO squeezing out epinephrine, metanephrine, uh, whatever that was, we were effectively blocking it with alpha blocking agents and beta blockers. And this is our medical prep, as you alluded to, uh, before surgery to get the patient uh, in good shape for it and to not have any uh, transient elevations of blood pressures, hopefully to uh, curtail that during surgery as well. Next slide, Hassan. And so here's our plan. Uh, Bob, who <laughs> should think about this, is an anesthesiologist. And so we needed a fast surgeon. And so we got a guy who does eight, eight minute gallbladder skin to skin. And so we said, we can't do any better than that. Let's see. Whipples in an hour and a half. Wow. So we got the fastest gun in town. So we're happy about that. And then we needed an anesthesiologist that was like hop along Cassidy. We needed somebody who could hop along. And so he said, we got a nitride drip, we got a neosinephrine drip, we're going to be on a blood pressure roller coaster. So mm -hmm. the blood pressure go up, and so the nitride, the blood pressure is going to go down, and then the neosinephrine. So when you're squeezing the tumor and tugging, you know, we need a nitride. And then all of a sudden, whoa, you know, we had a drop in uh, the level of metanephrine, the metanephrine, because the surgeon is kind of laying off for a while, and he's actually ligating veins and arteries to the tumor. So the tumor is not exposed to the bloodstream as much anymore. And now we're getting hypotension. So mm -hmm. you've got to have an anesthesiologist. It just goes back and forth. And actually what you do is you hang both drips. You go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so then I was worried about the ash and the SAM. I was worried about the gradient the patient had, 90 millimeter gradient rest. So I'm going to put a TE probe in. Uh, those were the days when anesthesiologists didn't do the TE. So I'm putting a probe in. I'm going to take a look and watch the heart. So we're all in the OR, anesthesiologist, great surgeon, really fast, and uh, I'm doing a TE, cardiology. So we're all in the room, which is a good thing. Have everybody in the room at one time. And the tumor is the size of a fist, with, you know, grapefruit, whatever we have. Uh, next slide. Wow. So there she blows, big old tumor, and uh, Put your fist right down there next to it, and then uh, we got some pathology, and uh, 
the, uh, you can see it looks like some hemorrhages within the tumor where it's outgrowing its blood supply. And you can just imagine getting a hemorrhage and then and then some of that metanephrine, the epinephrine gets into the bloodstream and I don't know what's happening to give you the cyclical pattern. The cyclical pattern was very, very predictable for us. And uh, next slide, we have lots of slides of the pathology of this tumor with H uh, and E stain. Uh, if you could give us the next slide, I think uh, we have some other slides uh, that uh, Hassan is going to get up. And so this is H and E stain. Looks very monotonous. Looks pretty nodular. Uh, looks like some colloidal substance there that's staining. Uh, looks like it's overlapped at the top a little bit, some overlap of the tumor. Uh, next slide. And the pathologist uh, said this is classical, has some hemorrhage in it, got blood vessels, uh, looks like a, a thick blood vessel up at the top. Come on down, next slide. And so because we were so prideful of having gotten this out safely, we made lots of slides. And so neurofibromatosis, NF1, affects approximately 1 in 3,500 individuals worldwide. I haven't seen neurofibromatosis since this case. So I don't know where the 3,500 individuals are. If you don't have a 3,500, you know, I must have seen 70,000 patients. And so that would be, there would be a lot of neurofibromatosis. There'd be 20. I would have seen 20 neurofibromatosis in my career. And I've only seen one uh, since medical school. And it's autosomal dominant inheritance with complete penetrance. And the field occurs in up to 5%. So again, this patient is advertising that he has a pheochromocytoma. He's got hypertension. You know, you could actually put a, couldn't do any better than tattoo. I've got a pheo. Look for it here. You know, so, so this is a, a number I guess we forget after medical school, the 5% of patients. And that's probably the most important thing about neurofibromatosis for me. You know, I remember some of the tumors and dumbbell tumors in the spine and some of the other crazy things you get. But uh, the pheochromocytoma is probably most significant for a cardiovascular disease specialist. Next slide. And so um, we wanted to continue the dialogue that we started here. And so, and so let's continue on and you'll see how uh, we segue into second case. So uh, next slide on our second case is a 56-year-old male who presented to my office with uncontrolled hypertension. Actually, it's somebody that I work with uh, quite frequently. I see him a couple times a year, especially sometime before April 15th, if you get my drift about what his employment is. And so I see him quite frequently a couple times a year. and. Uh, he uh, had some hypertension and was concerned about it. And he said he'd been carrying this diagnosis, you know, a bunch of medications, and they didn't seem to be working very well. He really didn't have a lot of complaints, uh, but the hypertension was bugging him, and uh, he didn't feel like he was at his best uh, this year before his takeoff for April 15th, when he works really hard for about three months. And so let's see the next slide. Past medical history, nothing. You know, hypertension in the family, diabetes in the family, Parkinson's disease. He's on a beta blocker. He's on a diuretic. He's on an alpha blocker. And so those are his medications, and he has no adverse drug effects. And his blood pressure when I saw him was still uncontrolled, 150 over 96. His weight was a little out of whack, and his, uh, probably uh, girth was a little out of whack as well at the time, and uh, but everything else uh, looked to be pretty normal. And here's this blood pressure, 150 over 96. And of course, you know, one of our best tests for looking at the long-term effects of long-standing high blood pressure to uh, measure whether it's been controlled or not is uh, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. This is really a key. It's like a hemoglobin A1C is for diabetes, if you're going to do an analogy. And so concentric LVH says, yes, 
he has high blood pressure, and no, it's not been controlled. And so as a cardiologist, that's one of the first things we go to when we're trying to figure out about somebody's blood pressure control. Sometimes you can look at the carotids. It's very unusual to get medial thickness um, thickening of the carotids. The echo is standard for us. Of course, EKGs can vary according to the body habitus, and you can have a lot of voltage in thin people and decreased voltage in fat people, and so it's not as reliable. The echo is, is spot on in uh, deciding whether someone's blood pressure has been well controlled. Let's see the next slide. And so here we are. Uh, He's on some Norvask. He's uh, getting some close follow-up. His blood pressure seems to be uh, controlled better on medications. But then we got a routine lab, and we found that uh, his potassium was 2.9. Now, he was on ACTZ, but uh, potassium usually doesn't go that low on ACTZ. But I do see people that come in the ER, not infrequently, that are on ACTZ without potassium supplements you have subnormal potassiums. And so that's not an unusual thing to find. And so we said, OK, let's put him on some potassium replacement. No big deal. It'll balance out. He'll be fine. And so the most surprising thing was on KCL tablets, I think it was about 10 or 20 milliequivalents, he comes back uh, three months later being very compliant. His potassium now is 2.6. That is unusual with someone on HCTZ and potassium replacement. So that's off the chart in terms of being an unusual event. And that means something else must be going on in this patient. So it's time to search for another cause. And so let's do some cortisol levels. Let's do an aldosterone level. Let's check the aldosterone renin level. The aldosterone is 29.9. That's, uh, that's a lot of aldosterone. You might call that hyperaldosteronism. The cortisol level is OK. I don't know what time of day it was done. Probably in the morning. That's when you usually do it, early AM cortisone. That's the usual order. And um, wait a minute, I'm going to lose touch. Hang on. OK. The renin level was less than 0.15. Well, let's see. That is very, very, very low. As a matter of fact, that gives us an aldosterone the renin level of infinity. And so, wow. So he has, by definition, looking at these numbers, hyperaldosteronism, etiology unknown. That's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, just like the other one. This is very, very clear cut information. It's not uh, borderline chemistries. Frequently, we do these tests on people that we see with high blood pressure, and we never see a positive one. But we see all these little borderline things, stuff jumping up and down, you know, a little bit of elevation of this or that. But we never see these are extreme measures, extreme limits. And uh, I like that, you know. It's not borderline. It's black or white. Next slide. So it's not uncommon that we see when we're doing CTs and MRIs, these little thickening of the adrenal gland uh, that is uh, basically little adenomas. We see them all the time. They're asymptomatic. Or, like, we got them all the time. We don't pay much attention to them. I always write it down somewhere in my problem list, thinking someday I'll be using that information and uh, someone will come down and have a adrenal adenoma. But, you know, that's active. It's physiologically active. But they don't. And it never does. And I've always got it on the chart. And I see them all the time. And maybe a couple out of 100 I see. And we're doing these CTs all the time on patients and finding these and not paying attention to them. And so here's one that makes a difference. And it's a small focal area of mild thickening of the inferior medial aspect of the left adrenal gland, which measures only about 15 millimeters in thickness, OK, 1.5 centimeters, although not entirely specific. It seems to sort of blend, probably represents a small Adrenal cortical adenoma. It's got sort of a blend. It's in the cortex, right? It's not the medulla, and it's kind of blending with the normal tissue, so it's not, and it doesn't stand out as being a encapsulated thing, but it's abnormal and it's, it's uh, certainly interrupting what you see as a little shallow adrenal gland frequently, just like a little triangle when you cross section it. Next slide. 
So again, looking at these, I, I'm sure I did uh, a chroma grinder day, and uh, I'm sure he was wasn't on a VMA free diet. So he probably had a banana or two, probably had some vanilla or something in a cupcake. And uh, urine serum catechrome means are normal. Light elevation of VMA doesn't mean a thing. 24 hour urines are pretty hard to collect, it's pretty hard to get good data. And so, next slide. So, he's going to have surgery, and uh, he's very interested in getting this done and see if this is going to help his uh, hypertension. So, we look around to find out who the leaders are in doing this procedure. We find somebody at Hopkins that's one of the leaders. And actually, he retired was at Hilton Head, and I called him up and had a conversation with him about the laparoscopic adrenalectomy. And we found somebody at uh, Moffitt who had considerable experience. Uh, we also found somebody at Moffitt who lived in another city who would come in every once in a while, once a month, and do stuff at Moffitt. And um, that wasn't a good option for us. So uh, we did find somebody with some experience. And actually, I went out there with the patient when he was seen by the doctor. And then uh, when he had his surgery, I met him there at 5.30 in the morning. And uh, we get anesthesiology alert to what we're doing. And of course, I meet with the surgeon, and we have a discussion. And the patient's own cardiologist shows up pre-op at 5.30 in the morning. That means that you're under scrutiny. And uh, everybody better be on their toes, and you better be doing a good job, because uh, someone's looking over your shoulder. And so I didn't exactly carry a gun with me to put a gun to their head, but I'm going to be watching them, and, uh, and I'm going to be talking to them, and I'm going in the OR with them. And so we did. They did a great job. I was really pleased with where everything went, and a cortical adenoma at 1.3 was removed. So this so-called Kahn syndrome, with a specific adenoma, not bilateral hyperplasia, but a specific adenoma being responsible for hyperaldosteronism in its purest form. Next slide. And we got some pictures that show the uh, adrenal cortex, and what we used to learn is uh, salt, sugar, and sex which is aldosterone, cortisoandrogens, and then the adrenal medulla cortex consisting of pulmonarulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And so catechol means come from in here, and aldosterone comes from out here. Very segregated uh, areas of the adrenal gland. This is the adrenal triangle. It always looks like that. A nice cross-section. Next slide. And this is pretty good because you can see these sections again. And uh, this is what it looks like schematically. And uh, this is what it looks like in reality. Aldosterone coming from there, cortisone from here, androgens, and then medulla with epinephrine. Isn't that interesting the way this is layered? Very, very interesting to see the layering. And then here's the vein, and here's the arteries. And this is all familiar, and you can see this in terms of the previous patient that we showed looks pretty much like that, and so except there was a lot of it. And so these are darker. This is the uh, H&E stain. And so next slide. And here's the adrenal cortical adenoma, and uh, this is the tissue that you see, and uh, called neoplastic here. Those mean new cells and then with montotic activity and necrosis wasn't seen. There's mild nuclear pleomorphism. And I'm not a pathologist, so I'm not going to describe this in detail for you. Next slide. So in the interim, after the tumor is excised, it does have some abnormal creatinine, maybe from elevated high bone pressure for a long time. Um, he had potassium that's normal now, not being on potassium pills. And his blood pressure is 130 over 80 without treatment. So we've got a cure. So that's mm -hmm. good because some you take it out and he's still got hypertension. And uh, his hypertension was related to that, but it's going to continue because of the permanent changes. Uh, and uh, this 
patient uh, will certainly have regression of LDH uh, on his echocardiogram. And he, he's done very well uh, with this therapy. Very that we had a surgical cure of two patients now. I'll show you two patients with a surgical cure of hypertension. Nice. Nice. Next slide. So we thought we'd tell a little bit more about uh, and the imaging, both kidneys normal size and MRI, two renal arteries, everything looks fine. And uh, everything was great in terms of his imaging. And we did it do it because he's a patient of mine, had long-standing hypertension. People with hypertension develop coronary artery disease. And don't forget it because if you follow a patient with hypertension over 20 or 30 years, no matter what you do, they're going to get coronary artery disease, and one day they're going to pop up with an MI, uh, or they're going to have a, a silent MI, or something's going to turn out. So you can just count on that. And so usually uh, professors in medical schools don't have long-term follow-up patients because there are nomads and go from university to university as they ascend the uh, hierarchy of uh, the uh, medical uh, practice and uh, from uh, instructor to assistant professor to associate professor to professor, you got to go somewhere else and you keep moving up the ladder. So you don't have long-term follow-up of anybody. At the most, you're in one place for five years. And so for me to be able to present patients with 30 and 40-year follow-up is meaningful because nobody has that anymore. So to be able to tell you that, yeah, everybody we have with hypertension ultimately develops coronary artery disease is a gift to you. And uh, it tells us, let's look at a coronary CPA and make sure the patient doesn't have that since we have such a great screening test. And that's why if we get these images and manage the patient based on these images, it was recently shown by the continuation of a subgroup of the Scottish study that there's a drop in 50% of fatal, non-fatal MIs by using coronary CPA observations versus standard of care. That's a home run. Let's see the coronary CT images this time. So this is their uh, coronary CT. And you can see the arch in the right coronary artery. You can also see the left atrial size looks pretty good. We can see the ventricle does look a little thick in here. We can actually go over here and pick up a ruler. And then let's get to where we see. We see capillary muscles. Let's get where we see the cords. And we're starting there as a cord. You can see a cord, you got a good study. You also have a good place to measure. And so if we want to measure here, let's see what our measurement is. And we come across here, and uh-oh, that is supposed to be 11. And let's measure this one at the same site. And uh, well, it's like LVH to me. And so, well, that's consistent with having long-standing, uncontrolled hypertension. And it should regress over time. At least we see that happen all the time. LVH itself is a risk for mortality. And uh, having LVH changes the actuarial formula. But we can look at its heart muscle, and we don't see any infarcts. We also don't see any infarctlets. Infarctlets are little infarcts that occur in the subendocardial space where uh, there hasn't been enough uh, blood supply. There's a little black spot there. That's a little fatty replacement. You go back. It looked like there was one little infarctus in there. You can see these little fatty replacements of cells. In the, there it is right there in the myocardium. And so, um, so they have some little infarctus, not very much. Here's the esophagus. And so let's take a look at his coronaries. So we'll bring you back to there. And let's take you over here. And this uh, is looking at his coronary arteries externally. And so let's take a look at them internally. And so Come up in a minute. There's a delay of 300 microseconds, 300 milliseconds of me, me, me being remote in North Carolina, manipulating these images, but that's longer delay than that. 
And so uh, we can go to other images to show you pointers. Uh, and here's what I can do. Let's go over here and let's do this. And so come on, coronaries. And so there we go. And so it's like a little calcification I can see there. Let's open that up a little bit and take a better look. And there's coronary calcification. So coronary calcification has a less than 1% per year chance of having a heart attack. Doesn't really seem to be doing much. Sometimes there's erosion uh, through a vessel wall into the endothelium, but very rarely. And so usually the coronary calcifications are one and done. If someone has something uh, that caused a macrophages to migrate in, the right lipid, the right hereditary, and uh, then some kind of uh, inflammatory disease that precipitated a plaque, and then the plaque goes down the line from fatty plaque to fatty fibrosis to fibrosis to then uh, calcification, which is usually caving over a non-calcified plaque ultimately and pushing it out to positive remodeling. And that neutralizes uh, the lesion and makes it so that it's not a risky lesion anymore. So that's nature's own way of providing for this. And there's another little lump of calcium right there. And, uh, a little bit here, and so there you go. And so coronaries look pretty good, and uh, very little unlikely episodes of having a cardiac event and left it to hypertrophy, which we've got to basically uh, get rid of uh, by texture of time and not being hypertensive. So let's go back to our slide deck again. You can see this is an excellent screening test. Non-obstructive coronary disease, mild atherosclerosis, mild LVH, mild left atrial enlargement. Next slide. And so we've got case number three uh, as a sequelae to follow up on these two cases and what they told us. Let's see what the last case can tell us, Sherlock. Next slide, please. These are definitely Sherlock Holmes type cases, and so. Here's our third case for today. We thought we would squeeze this in because it's so interesting. It's a 45-year-old male from the Air Force Base who's retired military and he presented to our office in July 2015. He had recently been hospitalized with left chest pain, left shoulder pain, and uh, had been discharged from the hospital, had some shortness of breath at that time, was trying to have a sinus tachycardia, and he had a potassium of 5, uh, 2.8. Potassium was 2.8. Uh, other electrolytes were normal. Uh, I think he had a low arrhythmia. Uh, I'm not sure it really was a sinus tachycardia. It could have been an atrial tachycardia. He was managed conservatively, given oral potassium pills and discharged home. Next slide. And so we've got a guy who uh, basically hypertriglyceridemia. Some we thought his chest pain was GERD. He's on a as though. He had some elevated cholesterol on Lipitor. He used to smoke. He quit. Went to smoke with tobacco, occasional alcohol, and two cups of coffee a day. Moderate exercise because he's at Mitchell Air Force Base. Next slide. And so his blood pressure here was 120 over 82. Next slide. And so we probably did an EKG. So let's see our next slide. And there's his EKG that this is at this time of the sinus tachycardia. He's got uh, some interventricular conduction of the body. It looks like it's greater than 0 0.08. And there's some poor airway progression and uh, a Q wave in 1 and L, which is normal. And uh, some negative axis axis of minus 30. And that's about it. Next slide. And we did a stress test, which uh, wasn't very remarkable in terms of his blood pressure when he came in. The diastolic was elevated. He exercised 8 minutes and 31 seconds, which is not good for a guy his age. He got his heart rate up, and uh, blood pressure rose to a maximum 160 or 81. Not very impressive. That's the leg discomfort. Probably he doesn't exercise a lot. Next slide.
Oh, that's a stress test. So he did get a stress echo. And uh, and he did okay. And uh, he did uh, have a normal contractility. And uh, everything looked appropriate on his, uh, on his exercise test. Everything looked appropriate. And so, actually, and his blood pressure, when he, we saw him in the office, and from his medical records from outside the hospital, uh, were at, was abnormal. So he was having abnormal blood pressure and hypokalemia, and he had minimal non-obstructive carotid disease and normal carotid hemodynamics. And so this gentleman also has hypertension and hypokalemia of uncertain etiology and has never been treated. And so what do you do when you got hypertension and hyperkalemia? Well, you saw uh, the patient I showed before. Perhaps there's something similar going on. And so this is the first time we saw him and we're taking a history and he said, yeah, you know, I got smokeless tobacco. That's the only thing we could come up with that sounded interesting. So we said, uh, go out in the truck and get your can and bring it back in. Let's take a look at it. Here's all the warnings. Tobacco is addictive, causes mouth cancer, all these things. But he quit smoking. He's using this stuff. That's classic wintergreen. And uh, let's see what's in this stuff. So we got the students to uh, start looking. And the classic blend is dominated by cinnamon. Wintergreen is blended with peppermint, wintergreen oil, and licorice root. And anise produced a mild flavor and a licorice blend. And apparently licorice is a frequent Additive. There are additives for uh, basically licorice, molasses, fruit, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, licorice is approved by the FDA as a flavor. There's an artificial flavor. There's a real flavor. And uh, the flavor certainly is enticing. Uh, and uh, licorice uh, can be used with any amount because there's no control by the FDA. It's just approved as a flavor. So next slide. Mm -hmm. Licorice was a sweetener for tobacco. It's still used in a huge amount in tobacco products. Being used for licorice worldwide is uh, for tobacco. And uh, the manufacturers for licorice made from uh, wood from a tree uh, sold about 73% of its products in 2005 to the tobacco industry. It's basically licorice. It's unflavored. Uh, it's, caught, it's used as flavor. You can use it unflavored without licorice or flavor with licorice. Cherry, berry, wintergreen, all this stuff is used. Rambouille, all this stuff is used frequently. But licorice is number one. Number one flavoring and chewing tobacco uh, are in snuff. And so we're looking at licorice and seeing we got licorice root. If you go to the health food store, not very healthy. We got licorice mint. We got licorice plants, look like that. We got licorice lutens. I don't know if this is licorice flavor artificially or if it's real licorice. Here's more licorice root. Here's Montana black licorice whips. And uh, here's one that actually is sort of uh, decontaminated by deglycerizinated licorice. It's called DGL. It doesn't have the glycerizin uh, that causes high blood pressure. So let's find out about glycerizin. Next slide. And glyceruric acid is metabolized to glyceretic acid and it gives us 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2 called HSD 11B. And by inhibiting that, the cortisone is not broken down. And the cortisone likes the aldosterone receptor. And so it locks onto there, kidneys lose potassium, retains sodium, and you get all the results of hypokalemia, including hypertension. Next slide. And here's the chemistry of cortisol, metabolized to cortisone. And here is the enzyme we're talking about, 11-beta-hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase 2. And here's glyceruric acid, which basically is coming and inhibiting this, keeping the cortisol around from being metabolized to cortisone, goes to the aldosterone receptor, and basically loses potassium. Next. And so we've got uh, excess of mineral corticoid, uh, a deficiency, low red and low aldosterone. And so uh, basically this is another uh, problem. This is a disease that 
that is effective also in, uh, in producing the same thing. Next slide. So this is the acquired form versus uh, the born form. And so this is called pseudo-aldosteronism, and it's caused by liberation. So the gentleman didn't come back. We said you have to stop the snuff. We don't want you using anything that has licorice content. He was very upset about that and uh, left a can of snuff for us to make a picture of and uh, went to his truck and didn't come back. And so we'll try to get him back again for follow-up. <laughs> he likes snuff, I'm afraid. I don't think he's going to make any changes. So that concludes our, our conference right on time today. And you've seen three very interesting cases three cases you'll probably never see again, but we want you to think about it. I want you to think about, you know, pheochromocytoma. We always mention it when we're doing a workup. We never see one. This patient had the trademark skin findings of zero fibromatosis, which says basically I'll have a pheo until proven otherwise. And the dramatic uh, results are some kind of weird rhythm to his hypertension of uh, squeezing out pedinephrine and epinephrine. And then in the next case, uh, somebody with Hun syndrome with a distinct green white noma. And in this case, hyperaldosterone is caused by uh, someone who has uh, used uh, a licorice uh, something. So uh, with higher licorice, it's hard to tell. You never can tell, you know, what's got licorice, how much licorice is in it, and so there's something to think about. So thank you very much. We had a great conference today, and uh, I enjoyed having you visit. I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.